There is some controversy this morning surrounding a new book out today that details one investigation into former President Donald Trump. Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg says the book titled People vs. Donald Trump, an inside account by former prosecutor Mark Pomerantz, could harm the ongoing criminal investigation into the former president and his family's real estate company. Ahead of the book's release, Bragg's office sent a letter to Pomerantz and the book's publisher, Simon & Schuster, expressing him concerns. One year ago, Pomerantz was a lead attorney in the Manhattan District Attorney's investigation into former President Trump and his business practices. Pomerantz had been assigned to the Trump case by then District Attorney Cy Vance. Pomerantz abruptly resigned in protest last February, along with another senior prosecutor, Kerry Dunn, citing frustration over disagreements with the Manhattan DA about how the case should proceed. In his resignation letter, Pomerantz asserted that the new DA at the time, Alvin Bragg, had, quote, suspended indefinitely the investigation and stated he did not want to, quote, become a passive participant in what I believe to be a grave failure of justice. But in the time between Pomerantz's resignation and his new book's publication, District Attorney Bragg's investigation to Trump has picked up some steam with December's conviction of the Trump Organization for running a 15-year tax fraud scheme. The probe also appeared to accelerate last month when D.A. Bragg began showing a grand jury evidence and met with Trump's personal attorney, his former personal attorney, Michael Cohen, about hush money paid to adult film actress Stormy Daniels, who alleged a long-denied affair with Trump. Amid all of that, Pomerantz's new book hits bookstores today, giving a first-hand account of what happened inside the district attorney's office during his year there. And Mark joins us now. He's a former special assistant district attorney for New York County. Mr. Pomerantz, thanks for being here today. It's good to see you. Thank you for having me. So let's, Great to be here. let's work backwards sort sure. of and start with some of the criticism from D.A. Bragg and others who've said you could be compromising an ongoing investigation by writing this book, putting all this information out into public. What do you say to that? Well, I wrote the book uh, to point out that there needed to be a prosecution, that the facts warranted prosecution. The last thing I wanted to do or would do would be to interfere with the investigation or a potential prosecution. And I'm confident that I am not interfering. Nothing in the book compromises what the district attorney may be doing now. I say that because the facts relating to the uh, payment of hush money to Stormy Daniels and the reimbursement, those facts have been out in the public domain for years and years. Uh, and uh, the question is what will be made of them, but I haven't compromised those facts. And the same is true with respect to the financial statement investigation that was uh, the main focus of our labors at the end of uh, 2021. Are you heartened at all by all that has happened since uh, you put the, the book to bed, which is to say the prosecution conviction of, of Alan Weisselberg on financial on the tax fraud scheme, and also the presentation of evidence to a grand jury now in the payoff, the alleged payoff to Stormy Daniels. Do you believe it's now moving a little bit faster than it was when you were there? I, I hope it is. Uh, I, I uh, certainly think there needs to be a prosecution. The facts warrant a prosecution, and the book details uh, the reasons why that was and is my view. So if there is a prosecution, that's great. And hopefully the district attorney will, uh, will do what needs to be done. Uh, I've been asked by friends, well, is this too little too late, or is it better late than never? And my response is, it's all of those things. So we sort of briefly summarized the objections you raised in your resignation letter. Um, but I'll let you flesh those out a little bit. And your frustration was shared by a lot of people watching this case who thought, boy, it sure looks, even from the outside, like you've got the former president on some of this stuff. Why, in your estimation, did Attorney General Bragg, in your view, slow walk this? Why wasn't there a race to, to go after Donald Trump? You know, I, I don't know exactly what was in the district attorney's uh, mind, but uh, I can surmise that what happened may have been that with stakes this high, involving a potential defendant who is so practiced in the art of intimidation, uh, human nature is such that you look for uh, the perfect case. You look for circumstances that virtually compel you to act and you magnify whatever problems may exist in a case. And the practical impact of that is to create a separate standard for somebody like Donald Trump when I believe that if the same facts had been shown with respect to somebody who was not as prominent, 
uh, who did not have the political influence, who did not have the power and authority of a former president of the United States, if it was just the average Joe, the average Joe would have been indicted on these facts without really, I think, any debate. So it's fair to say they were afraid of Donald Trump, not just because of the way he would prosecute it out in public, but because he also might run for president again? No, I'm not saying that the district attorney was afraid of Donald Trump, and I don't believe that. What I am saying is that it's human nature uh, to be cautious in a matter with such high stakes, and the caution can lead to paralysis. And uh, one of the reasons I wrote the book was to explain what ought go through, in my judgment, prosecutors' minds as they approach decisions in all cases, whether it's uh, a, a president, uh, a prince, or a pauper, as they say. And, and to me, the thought process should be the same, and the standards you use to evaluate the case should be the same. And Joe, Mark is describing a frustration we've heard a lot on our show over the last couple of years, which is either somebody, the law applies to everybody or it doesn't. Is there an exception for well, somebody well, exactly. because he's rich and powerful? Well, exactly. And I just wonder what it says about the fact that the Manhattan DA apparently had a different standard for Donald Trump. Uh, than for everybody else. Uh, what, what does it say about all these things? We saw it even, uh, Mr. Pomerantz, with the Mueller report, where, uh, you know, they said, well, you know, crimes may have taken place, but we can't do anything because he's president of the United States. That was twisted and contorted by mm -hmm. Donald Trump and Trump supporters, uh, just like this, this, this DA decision was. I mean, what does it say about the fact that prosecutors have put Donald Trump in a category by himself and our belief that, you know, everybody is accountable, no man is above the law, apparently doesn't apply to Donald Trump. Well, you, you have to consider that presidents are different to an extent. The Department of Justice policy is you cannot indict a sitting president. I believe when Cy Vance, as district attorney, looked at the hush money facts, uh, as he did in 2019 when Donald Trump was also the sitting president, uh, he may have decided that it, it's something you just can't do as a local prosecutor to indict a sitting president. But once 2021 came along, of course, Donald Trump was no longer the sitting president. The investigation, in fact, related to conduct that took place before he was president of the United States. And then, in my judgment, the kind of legal handcuffs that surround charging an existing, a sitting president, those legal handcuffs are removed, and what prosecutors have to do is treat him like they would anybody else and ask themselves, do they believe uh, that uh, the, the potential defendant is guilty? Is the evidence legally sufficient to establish guilt beyond a reasonable doubt? Uh, is there a reasonable chance of conviction? And then you look at the aggravating and mitigating circumstances. And when we did that, I thought with respect to uh, Donald Trump, all the lights were green. And uh, right. uh, by those regular criteria, we should go ahead. Yep. And, and uh, you, just to, to follow up on what you said before about how he should be held to the same standard, I knew members of Congress that I served with that got indicted for a lot less than what Donald Trump did paying, you know, uh, hush money off, uh, funneling it through somebody else a couple of days before an election. I mean, you talk about the lights uh, blinking red there. They certainly were. So let me ask you, what was the most compelling evidence that you had that a crime had been committed and, and, and that the president, ex-president, should be charged? Well, with respect to the financial statements, the evidence that they were false and that the values were overstated was just uh, a massive amount of evidence. It's summarized in the attorney general's civil complaint that was filed in September against Trump and his organization and others. With respect to Trump's involvement in the preparation of the financial statement, you had to look at the whole surrounding complex of circumstances. These were his properties that he had uh, work to assemble and build for a lifetime. The financial statements were used for his advantage. They were put together by people who worked for him. Uh, and he has a long history of lying and exaggerating about his assets uh, and his net worth. So you put together 
the whole pattern of circumstances, and I at least came to the judgment that the case was a strong one. It was not a perfect case, few cases are, but in my judgment it was strong enough so that we should proceed with it. And that was a judgment that the previous district attorney shared. So Mark, you just laid out the evidence of a possible prosecution, and we know the investigation has ramped up again. So let's just take one leap forward and say that yes, a charge is levied against the former president. Take us inside the courtroom as to what that would be like. This hypothetical case against a former president of the United States before a jury where everyone in there is gonna have really defined opinions one way or the other about him. Well, it will be uh, uh, a proceeding if it happens unlike many others. Uh, even the arraignment of the Trump Organization and the CFO uh, was, uh, uh, I won't say it was a three-ring circus, but it was a very crowded courtroom. And uh, if indeed Donald Trump were to be charged and were to be present in the courtroom to be tried, I have no doubt that security would be fine. And I also have no doubt that eventually a judge would be able to pick an impartial jury. And uh, but it will surely be uh, something of a spectacle. But the legal system is strong enough, in my judgment, the rule of law is strong enough to handle something like that.